I will wander in. Um, but I think we should we should start um, again. Uh, it's very strange how rapid it is at the AA that sort of events seem to kind of institutionalize themselves. I notice that already people are like sitting in the same seats as they have been for a while. There's sort of Irene there, Mark there. <laughs> uh, we want to discuss and debate with you today uh, about the nature of the Constitution. Um, this bizarre object that everyone knows we have one, but they don't know where it is or what it is. And I think it's widely accepted through the school that whatever else uh, we do this year, we must kind of put the Constitution on a kind of firm, clear footing so that everyone is confident that they know kind of what it is, uh, how it works. <coughs> and I think it's only fair in a way that uh, any incoming chair is confronted with a sort of a done deal about the Constitution and about the chair's relation to the Constitution. Uh, I'm also aware that uh, if, if this meeting in some sense is going to have tangible outcomes in terms of writing the Constitution and the work that would have to be done, uh, this meeting really is something is a meeting which will only just begin to open the question and in a sense to kind of scratch the surface of the problem. Uh, so Hugo and I had kind of uh, had a brief discussion about sort of when this meeting ends, that that's not the end of it. I think in, in the first instance, um, if people could send Hugo uh, comments, observations, proposals about the Constitution, about the Constitution as a whole, or about some aspect of the Constitution, then in a sense we can sort of begin to gather those things together uh, and try to present kind of some more adequate document for the school and perhaps there then need to be kind of working parties, whatever. So the point is that um, you know, this meeting, as I say, really only begins to open a question which a lot more work will have to be devoted to. Now, obviously, Hugo, you know, but I'd like to introduce Sam Ashenden uh, from Birkbeck. Um, Sam was a wonderful student of Paul Hurst, who taught here and tragically died last year. Um, and she followed all Paul's kind of arguments about the nature of constitutions, <coughs> in particular in respect to participatory democracy. Uh, and we thought it would be a good idea uh, to start this meeting if we had someone from outside, someone um, who is concerned with what you might call the political theory of participatory democracy, to give us a sort of broad indication of the nature of participatory democracy and its guiding principles. So let me first introduce Sam Ashenden. Thank you. Um, <coughs> first of all, thank you for uh, listening to me. Um, what I want to do very briefly is to outline something of my understanding of the importance of the Architectural Association and then give you some brief um, pointers to the way in which Paul, in particular, thought through um, associative models of democratic governance, which I think um, mirror quite closely some of the ways in which the best features of the AA um, are borne out. The Architectural Association as a self-governing institution inspires awe, and not to say envy, um, from across the road there, the University of London. Um, Precisely because you are a self-governing, independent institution. Now, what does that mean? I suppose at, at core to me, someone who's worked within the University of London for a decade, that means um, not entertaining a kind of division, a divisive division between staff and students <coughs> that one finds in conventional universities, increasingly enforced by things like the RAE, 
um, research assessment exercise, for those of you who are blissfully ignorant of this, um, quality assurance mechanisms, those things which have bureaucratized higher education across this country in the last decade, um, endlessly bureaucratized um, higher education. Now, that division, that divisive division between students and staff, um, I think is, is not borne out particularly well at Birkbeck, luckily, because we have mature students who are out to get all they can get out of the institution and prepared to put back into it. But what it does, I think, in its worst, um, in the worst case scenario, is create um, a sense in which things are as they have to be and will persist because this is the way they are. In other words, it creates a sense in which disciplines become closed in on themselves and self-perpetuating and the infrastructure of, of departments and the funding that accompanies that creates a kind of a, a conflict between one department and another within an institution. It makes work across conventional academic boundaries very difficult to achieve and sustain. I know this is someone who runs a multidisciplinary degree across the road. Um, the AA, on the other hand, by um, being grounded in a participatory model of democratic governance, enables all who are present within the institution to have voice in it, an equal voice in the discussion um, as to um, the functioning of the institution. That in turn then prevents a, a, um, an unhelpful division between those who lead and those who are led. And after all, if academic, if, if this institution and other institutions of higher education are about anything, they ought to be about um, providing the ground on which people can learn to think independently in order to become the future leaders of um, architectural um, practice, political practice, etc., etc. How do you achieve that if you create uh, an environment in which there are some who lead and there are others who are led? Um, so that, I would say, is, is the first and most important thing that perhaps your model of doing things has within it that an institution like the University of London or any other conventional university doesn't have. Now, what do conventional universities have in the way of democracy? Most of them have some kind of um, representative mechanisms for um, students to make their, usually their complaints actually, sometimes their, their kind of observations about how wonderful one is as a lecturer, but normally complaints, uh, complaints procedures, uh, which are important, yeah. Um, that filter through to various committees of staff and are dealt with via notice boards in corridors. So there's a sort of, um, there's, a, there's a complaints procedure. In addition to that, you'll find um, representation of students on um, various committees of staff making policy decisions. This is very different, th th that kind of representative model, the idea that the guy from the students' union, the, the eternal activist kind of turns up to meetings and, and makes the case. <coughs> um, that's a very different model from the kind of participatory self-government that um, the AA perhaps is, is a beacon of in this kind of corner of the world. Because what one is asked to do as a member of a self-governing institution is precisely to govern oneself and to play a role in governing others. In other words, to engage in the debate about what we want to do, where we want to go, who are we, that can enable the institution to be innovative, to develop, to move at the same time as, as taking hearts and minds with it. Now this is very different from having a representative, you know, I, I elect um, my MP, my MEP, and they toddle off um, and supposedly represent me. I do nothing but turn up and vote once every now and again. This is a very passive kind of model in which there is a very clear distinction between uh, my MP and myself. Um, I don't think a great deal of my MP, but I won't tell you where I live. Um, <laughs> uh, that's very different from me actually turning up to, whether it's a meeting at Birkbeck, here or elsewhere, and arguing with my fellows about how I think we ought to conduct our affairs. And that is the, the kind of participatory model of which Marx speaks, and which Paul Hurst very much um, emphasized in the book Associative Democracy, amongst other places. I mean, Associative Democracy gives you a kind of core account of um, associational mechanisms. Now, to turn to Paul a bit more closely, I mean, 
I suppose the core of his argument is an argument against <coughs> what he regarded as an over-centralized and far too complex state trying to produce um, policy for a complicated and pluralist society. So Paul's starting point is the premise that the state is not a very good vehicle for um, producing very uh, adequate policy to meet a, a plural um, social form. Paul, though unhappy <coughs> with the market as a solution to that, then looked back to the um, writings of, of people like Lasky, GDH Cole, Figgis and others to build an account of how bodies in civil society might make their own um, their own associations for getting things done, in which participation and um, exit are the right of every citizen. So I want something done, I, I um, join my local association, I participate in my local association, money incidentally follows me. This is always a bit that gets left out of the argument, but it's there in Hurst's text. Um, and I, I have to either, either um, just sign up and money follows me, I can be fairly passive in this, or more importantly, I can participate to produce um, things like social policies that more adequately reflect the needs that I feel I have as a citizen. So you, you build then a model of, of democratic decision making that actually engages people from the bottom up, rather than us fairly passively engaging in a weak model of representative democracy in which once every five years or so we are free, but then this produces the chains. You know, this, this produces a, um, a, a situation in which we do nothing but moan about government and feel disengaged from government. Paul's point very much was that um, rather than moaning about government and being disengaged from it, rather than moaning about the constitution of the AA or moaning about the um, head of the AA and, and doing nothing about it, and rather than simply sort of rampaging through the streets, one ought to engage with the mechanisms that exist in order to argue and to reflect and to change things in <coughs> desired directions. I'll shut up now unless you ask me to elaborate on anything in particular. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, Sam. <coughs> I want really to hand over as soon as possible to Hugo, but I just want to kind of make two points really uh, to begin to kind of translate uh, the point that Sam has made in kind of abstract or at a kind of larger level than the AA and think about what it means in terms uh, of the AA. Um, the obvious point is that Paul was concerned above all to produce mechanisms <coughs> which go in the opposite direction from that of passivity. You know, for him, as it were, if people are to be independent uh, and creative, it depended upon taking an active kind of relation to the institution, to what happens within it. And in that sense, you know, democracy is the mechanism for that. It's not just saying people have an abstract right to a vote. It is that the virtue of voting, the virtue of participatory democracy is to, to generate a certain level of activity, the opposite of passivity. And that's the first point. I think the second point bears on what Sam said about rep representative models. It's very important in our discussions at the AA <clears throat> that we distinguish very, very clearly between a model of representation and a model of participation. Um, if you think for a moment, you know, what would happen if we abolished participatory democracy at the AA and moved towards the more representational structure of the university? You know, clearly a vice chancellor of a university is subject to all sorts of checks and balances. Uh, like the AA, like the checks don't come in and the balances don't look too healthy. Um, the, the, the point really is that the kinds of representational framework, the way in which academics are represented on various boards traveling from a sort of departmental board right up to Senate, is one which automatically generates a great deal of bureaucracy. You know, the institution soon becomes riddled with committees 
with the time that the committees take, with the staff needed to serve those committees. Now, by contrast, if we look at a model of participatory democracy, obviously one of the things we do is to invest an incoming chair with really quite exceptional powers, right? Not because, as it were, we make an abstract virtue uh, of electing someone with exceptional powers, <clears throat> but because with those powers, as long as the relationship with the school works, that is to say, the chair, that he or she commands uh, you know, the overall support of the constituency, it's possible to, for the institution to function with the maximum degree of flexibility and the minimum degree of bureaucracy. Right? What one has to, to see, I think, is that all these parts of the AA, all these elements, actually fit together. The democracy goes precisely together with investing the chair in very considerable power, with very considerable powers. Um, and that generates a kind of uh, a permanent situation in which rather than being, as it were, responsive to a whole range of committees, the chair has simply to maintain or fail to maintain the confidence of the school and ultimately uh, that proposition can be put to the test uh, of a vote. So I've tried to kind of say something very briefly uh, about how we might begin to translate uh, Sam's terms into the AA and now I'm going to hand over to Hugo to deal with the real meat of it. Thank you, Mark. Uh, is that working? Yep. Um, I'm going to try very briefly to cover quite a lot of ground, and we haven't got much time. I want to lay out at least the bare bones of where we are now and <coughs> signal perhaps some questions about how we might want to make proposals for change, but I'm not at this meeting remotely interested in making proposals for change. I think what, what we need to do to start with is to make sure that everybody has really good information about where we are now and what the structures that we operate under. For that reason, the uh, IMG published a couple of weeks ago this document. I hope you've all got a copy. It was sent to every member of the school community. There are more copies here. The purpose of this is to lay out uh, very clearly the existing structure of the school. And it includes this diagram which attempts to, in a very oversimplified way, explain the relationships within the school. Now, as Sam and, and, and Mark have both touched upon, the, the, the problem of governance within any democratic model is a very subtle problem. It's not one of, of sort of designing a written legal document that will solve all of the problems of a finely tuned democratic institution. It needs a very light touch, and it needs very clear principles of the idea of what it is that you're trying to achieve. Otherwise, you end up writing immensely complicated documents which aim towards and achieve something <coughs> you didn't want to do at all. Constitutions are one form of structure that a, a, an institution might use in order to try to govern itself. Uh, and they're difficult to use well. <coughs> they can be far too prescriptive uh, and they're often, in fact, uh, very messy. Uh, many constitutional arrangements are actually broad frameworks of written laws, uh, other legal documents, written rules, precedents, balances of powers and debate. For example, the UK Constitution, I think it was mentioned in one of these earlier discussions, I think, um, by Paul Finch. Of course, the UK has a constitution, uh, but Britain is not governed by a single written document, which is the constitution. It's a very complicated framework, which doesn't work terribly well, but works better than some others might. And I believe, in fact, today in Rome, the EU is meeting to sign a constitution for the European Union, a terrifying prospect in some ways, that there could be written on one bit of paper a set of rules that would govern 25 countries uh, 
uh, an interesting and perhaps slightly worrying move. If I can briefly lay out the structures uh, of the AA, uh, and then at the end just raise a few questions, uh, but bearing in mind that the sort of democracy that the AA has had, a participatory democracy, cannot work if people don't participate. And to participate is not just a question of turning up to one or two meetings. It's actually a question of information. You need to have access to very good information. For that purpose, we publish things. We set up the <coughs> forum on the website, which has all the documents that currently exist there for anyone to look at. We need, as a, an organization, to have a constitution. But quite what that should be is very much a matter of debate. But we also need other structures that encourage involvement. We need rules of engagement, as it were, which may be written or may be uh, by precedent, but they are not a constitution. Uh, and we also need and have culture and traditions that set up what people understand to be what the school is trying to do. And those things are very difficult to write down. In a way, they die if you try to write them down. But we sort of know that there are very important things about the AA's traditions and its culture of education and debate, which would never be able to be prescribed <coughs> within a constitution. Now, some of the issues that we face are really can be summed up in saying that there are we need to try to find better ways to link and to promote dialogue between the different bits. And very simply, there are four bits of the current model. There is the council, there is the school, that's all the students and all the teachers, and together the council and <coughs> the school form something called the school community, which from time to time meets and votes on things. There is also the association, about 3,000 people all over the world, which includes you as members of the school. And there's the chair. And the chair's role was defined in 1971 and continues today as a model that we have. So those four bits, the council, the school, the association, and the chair, somehow have to find a way to have open dialogue, to have clear rules, uh, to have great flexibility and great creativity in how they work with each other. There are a few clear relationships already. The council and the chair have a clear relationship. They have a legal contract between each other and a schedule of duties. The school and the chair have a slightly less clear <coughs> relationship in that the school has a schedule of duties the chair has agreed to. Uh, and the school has informal management arrangements between the chair and the school. Uh, currently, for example, there's a structure of student representatives and staff representatives who from time to time would meet with the chair. And as Mark has already said, the, the only real sanction that the school has against the chair is not a constitutional one, but is simply that the chair is required by council to maintain the confidence of the school. And if the chair loses that, then the school has to start to operate a process of telling council that it has lost confidence in the chair, and then the council as employer has to do something about it. This brings us to the point, of course, in terms of the relationship between the school and the council, that the school has a rather strange relationship with the council in terms of advising the council on the selection of a chair or the reselection of an existing chair. Now that has no basis in law, it's not a constitutional issue, it's a tradition. Council decides, council appoints, but the school is always asked and through secret ballot actually gives its opinion. And it would obviously be very, very strange if council then said, well thank you for your opinion, we're going to do something else. So, but, but uh, the point being, this is not something constitutional, it's something that happens by tradition. If we look at the relationship between the council and the school, two other key actors in this, students can be on council, and from time to time there are two or even three students who are members of council. And that has at times been useful in the very early formations in the early 1970s, in fact, there were a very large number of students on council. They, they formed very much the new model of the council and the chairman. Staff, 
employed by the AA cannot be on council under the rules of the Charities Commission. If you're going to benefit from a charity, in other words, you're paid by the charity, you can't sit as a trustee of that charity. Uh, so there's a very clear legal separation there. It should be said that council at the moment are investigating that. Council are reviewing a need to review the legal structures under which they work in relation to the Charities Act and the Companies Act. And in doing that, they are interested in seeing whether there would be possibility of members of staff being members of council. That's something for us to think about uh, and to discuss. There is also the bigger animal, the association, which includes all of us, but is a total of 3,000 odd people around the world. Very valuable, very important to the AA, but not part of the school. And there is a relationship between the association, the council, and the school, which at the moment is mediated through the secretary to the council, who also is very much involved in the membership office and the relationships with the association. The association it is a great benefit, benefactor to the school. Many members of the association actually support the school financially, but in many other ways, as, as most of you know, that we have tremendous access to people throughout the world <coughs> that we wouldn't have if they weren't paying members. So that's the bare bones of this four-part, uh, and there are subdivisions and all sorts of other stuff in it, which I won't go into today. On the AA forum are published documents which make much clearer all of that, and they're, they're pressed in here, but the actual structure is forensically written there to the extent that it exists as a clear structure. Now let's look at the current situation. The AA has a legal constitution. Here it is. It's a very boring document indeed which is what, con which, what constitutions should be. It's a memorandum of association and it's articles of association and it's bylaws of an association. The legal constitution is a necessary thing to have. It sets out the relationship of the architectural association as a legal body in relation to outside organizations, questions <coughs> of debts, of legal responsibilities, of you know, correct procedures in law and so on. They have to be followed. Eighteen council members are elected from time to time by <coughs> all the membership, so by all those 3,000 people who choose to vote. They elect a council. Those 18 council members become directors of a company limited by guarantee. So that's what this memorandum of association is. It's the, the standard rules. This, these are the rules that any company limited by guarantee would use with minor mod mod modifications through bylaw changes. Those 18 council members are also trustees of a charity because the AA operates under another law, which is the Charities Act, which gives us great benefits in taxation purposes. Uh, but also constrains us because charities can't do certain things which companies can do. Charities are non-profitable, charities are supposed to be doing good things and we claim to be a charity because we educate <coughs> people uh, and that's considered fortunately to be a good thing still in this country though it's a marginal <laughs> uh, a balance as to whether the government will continue to consider that a good thing. So that's the legal constitution and there's no great magic to it, it's on, it's on the forum uh, you can go and read it if you want to. But that's not what we're really talking about when we're trying to talk about how could we improve the constitution of the AA. We're not really talking about you know, should we change Article 35B in a memorandum of agreement. <coughs> we're talking about this much more difficult framework of rules and traditions and relationships uh, and the powers and uh, interrelationships of the different parts. Now, there are some written rules of the school which are not part of the Constitution. For example, when we went through the process of reforming the school in 1971 and the role of chairman was first invented, it was thought necessary to have a, an elected body called Forum, which would, which would be what the chairman chaired. 
This is why the chairman is called a chairman. And that body had great powers. It included council members, students, and members of staff. And they had significant powers in instructing the chairman what to do in certain areas. The chairman still had overall authority and was accountable directly to the council, but had to work through the forum. And in 1973, a constitution was written for that forum. That exists on the website, uh, and you can have a look at it. It's out of date now, as it were. But this established, that constitution, established something called the school community. And that idea of the school community has remained a very rich and powerful idea in the subsequent history of the school. It's not, in fact, a legal or a sovereign body, but it has immense powers. Votes taken by the school community are very seriously considered uh, by the school. They decide at those votes things which are very important. You don't have a school community to discuss whether or not to have a coffee machine in the bar. You have a school community meeting when there are very serious issues to be debated and decisions made by it are not binding on council, but council will take very seriously what the school thinks. There's another role for school community meetings which has largely faded, which is that the tradition is that the chairman, being in an extremely powerful position, must use the school community meeting as a way of continually uh, opening up and revitalizing a dialogue with all members of the school community by reporting back to the school, by discussing issues with the school through that. Now that is written, in fact, into the schedule of duties under the contracts that have signed, been signed by recent chairman, but has largely fallen into disuse, something we might think about. Other written rules. There are written rules based on precedent for calling a school community meeting, for running it, for what would be a quorum, and for how it can vote. These have no basis in law. They're not part of any constitution. And in <coughs> fact, uh, they're not currently ratified in any clear form by the school community. So a proposal I shall make at the end, uh, the rules are on the forum website, is at the next school community meeting, those rules should be looked at carefully and the school community should then vote on whether it, not, it wants to operate under those rules. That then gives them some legitimacy. At the moment, I've put them together from an assembly of old forum rules, of a <coughs> precedent of how the school has worked recently, but they need to be ratified by the school community. So that's a separate thing. There's a legal constitution, and then there are some written rules, and we need to review them and see how they work, whether we could write them better, whether they're too prescriptive, whether they're not clear enough, and so on. So that's a job to be done. There's a third part of this, which in some ways is probably more important, which, for want of a better word, I've called traditions. Most institutions actually operate through a culture and through traditions. Underlying it, there are some rules, but it, they operate because people know and understand how the institution makes decisions. Here are some of the traditions that we have at the moment. Since 1974, Council has asked the school community for a ballot on re-electing a chair or appointing a new chair, a secret ballot of all school community members. That's a tradition. No reason why Council should do that. Uh, there's no reason why the school should bother to do it. It seems immensely valuable, and it means that Council is extremely well informed in making its legal decision to appoint a chair, but it's a tradition. Another one, since 1971, council gives to the chair, through the contract of employment, all powers and responsibilities for the school and for the association. Council remains legally responsible as trustees and as directors of a company, but they operate their constitutional responsibilities by simply saying step one of constitution we hand all of that to someone else we stand back if there's a real mess council will have to pick up the pieces as legal trustees and fine. <coughs> basically council is not running the school council is saying we are appointing someone else 
advised by the school, and we want to give them everything. Now, there's no reason to that. That's a tradition. That's the way that we've done it since 1971. The chair reports back to council and is in a direct employment relationship to council. There's nothing written into that that requires the chair to do very much in terms of reporting back to or being governed by the school, other than through the schedule of duties, which does make mention of the chair from time to time needing to report to the school through a school committee meeting. But it's very difficult to make that operate. So the chair is the chief executive of the association, of the whole shebang. The chair at the moment is fully responsible for that whole operation. 3,000 people all over the world, great budgets flowing here and there, decisions about how to organize events for members and so on. This is something the chair is responsible for. The chair is also the academic director of the school, is also the financial director of the school, is also the administrative <coughs> director of the school. So council has decided from 71, that the best model is to put all of that stuff into one box and give it to one person. There's no reason to do that. That's how it works at the moment. Council, of course, can't evolve, by doing that, doesn't devoid its legal responsibilities to the charity trustees and as a company. Council members are still personally accountable for the proper management of the assets of the school, they must not deliberately uh, cause loss to the AA by uh, imprudent or unlawful activities and you know, all the usual things, but, but basically they hand it over. So I've tried to say that when we have discussions about constitution, we need to be very careful what we're talking about. There is a legal constitution, we might want to suggest changes to that. That, to me, doesn't seem to be either the most important uh, or the most interesting part of this set of rules that we operate under. The other two, the written rules of engagement, as it were, and the traditions, seem to me to be a much richer and more important part of the culture of the school. And they are, I think, at the moment, not clearly enough Formed, they need to be reviewed, uh, but in doing so, we must be very careful that we don't push them towards a more prescriptive or a more bureaucratic structure. The great value and strength of the AA is exactly that it doesn't have prescriptive and bureaucratic structures. It doesn't have endless rules and committees and organisations. And that's a fantastically valuable thing that we have. And if we were to move <coughs> along the road of saying, OK, let's produce ten books that set out exactly that the diploma school has to do this, and we would kill the whole thing stone dead. So it's a very subtle thing that we need to do over the next few months. In some ways, the AA is very simple. It's a very small place. It has a single focus. It's only really trying to do one thing, providing the right culture of debate and education to form people through the experience of being here <coughs> into really interesting people. It's, you know, in some ways, it's not a big problem. It's a very small place, and it's trying to do a relatively simple thing. If you compare it to most companies, most <coughs> companies, it's, it's not very difficult. On the other hand, as we all know, the AA is immensely complex. Although it's simple, it's complex. It was founded as a participatory democracy in uh, 1847 or whenever it was. And the whole thing about a participatory democracy, as has already been said, is that it needs to be continually refreshed. It can only be participatory if the electorate knows what's going on, if the electorate is engaged, if the electorate bothers to find out what are the structures, do we want to change them, why do we want to change them, what would work better. If the electorate is passive, then there's not much point in having uh, a participatory democracy. Although the AA has a very simple constitutional structure, the framework of traditions uh, and unwritten and written things that I've suggested is in fact quite complex. 
and they to some extent contradict each other and there is a sort of muddle there. So it is complex and in that way needs cleaning up. I think all the changes, we, we should guide our work partly to avoid bureaucracy, to avoid overprescription, but also positively to aim for a clarification of the responsibilities, the powers, and the roles that should be played between those four parts, between the council, the chair, the school, and the association. That is our job. How could we make that clearer, more effective, uh, without pinning it down to some dreadful structure of uh, bureaucracy that would kill it? At the back of all of these discussions is really that our aim must always be to provide the very best conditions for continuing to nurture <coughs> culture of education and debate that is so strong in the AA. Anything we do that would damage that must be a step in the wrong direction. So there's sort of always a warning signal. Now, if we're proposing doing something, actually, is it really valuable or is it going to damage the way that we work? Now, I have noted three or four specific proposals, but I'm not sure this is the right sort of meeting to make those proposals. I think, first of all, it would be good to, because I've gone on for far too long, to at least have some discussion about the things I've said and that the mm -hmm. other people have said, so that we can open that up. Um, okay, I well, I mean, since it. we've already said that um, after this meeting, uh, Hugo and I would kind of welcome you to kind of send kind of observations, proposals, whatever, so that we can begin to kind of edit it uh, into the framework for further meetings and work. Perhaps kind of questions and, uh, I mean, I don't think it's the moment to, for people to make kind of detailed and specific uh, proposals or anything, um, but it is very important to get back from you a kind of general sense of response to what's been put forward. So could we take observations from the floor. Here from Manas. Um, I was concerned that we would have a very little... Oh. I don't think people can hear you. Okay. I was concerned in the beginning that I didn't know anything about the constitution of the air that we would have a very rigid one. But I'm quite happy to know that we have uh, written and sort of an unwritten constitution with traditions and a certain, I think we have a, a culture now and history that's part of the tradition now. So I don't think it would be a problem to refine it further, provided we don't write down or structure it, but just to sort of use it as a discussion base. But I think it's a very good model so far. Mm -hmm. Peter, is, is, is the microphone? Yes. It's, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> um, I think I've got a question that might say or between you, both parties. Um, I was wondering if there was anything in um, the fact that legally we were a charity and that you were looking into maybe advantageous changes to that. Is there anything from that layer of structure that would impact on traditions, as one might think of them in the way that we operate <coughs> internally? It may be an impossible question to answer, but I just <coughs> was wondering about what kind of connections there might be between these different layers. Um, I think that the, the comment I would make is that perhaps the change that, that <coughs> in the notion of, of um, an institution which relies upon tradition um, and uh, a very clear statement that's been made, which is the size and scale, <coughs> then in a sense, the uh, notion that you have to do is to protect, I think as Paul Finch said, your governance from its legal requirements because obviously from a council perspective, the institution has to function legally and obviously as we know, laws and legislation become, have become tougher and tougher and in fact are working away from the notion of flexibility and tradition towards prescription. I think the the, if there is one word that I think is perhaps missing or we need to keep in our mind, it's the notion of transparency. And it seems to me that actually transparency, the kind of notion of transparency in uh, institutions has changed dramatically in the last uh, 30 years. 
and therefore I think that perhaps there isn't enough clarity of that transparency between the layers of the different parties that are involved in this, in this constitution. And perhaps it is that transparency that we need to kind of tease out in whatever the kind of light set of rules or relationships. And so that's a kind of, the, the, if, if that helps, that's what. Any other points that people want to no. make? Um, so sort of just a leading question to you, Hugo. You didn't really explain why forum doesn't exist anymore mm -hmm. in a way that um, there is something within those traditions where things have faded away and perhaps it might be for the audience useful for you to expand on that. Yes, I mean, I, I'm not, uh, I don't know all the, all the uh, difficult details of it. Alvin was appointed as the chairman in 71 and continued for 19 years to be the chairman. Alvin's <coughs> idea of how to develop the school was based on a very centralized uh, power into what he should be able to do. And he found it extremely frustrating and annoying to have to work through forum or with forum. So uh, from very early on in the early 1970s, there was a conflict between the idea that Alvin as chairman had of the potential and the role of chairman and his responsibilities back to council in order to make the school a great success and what he saw as an impediment to that role of having some form of uh, body that he had to refer to all the time and, and discuss things with. So slowly, by attrition, he managed to uh, reduce the powers and sidestep the powers uh, and find other ways of getting decisions made until eventually forum sort of dissolved itself, as far as I remember, in the sort of late 70s, uh, out of frustration. Forum members said, well, there's no point in having forum meetings. The chairman doesn't even bother to come to forum meetings anymore, so why should we go? <coughs> Other people in the AA know a lot more about some of the bloodier details of that battle, but it was a power struggle, essentially, between a model of a single all-powerful chairman and the model that had been put in place was that there would be an all-powerful chairman, but that they must work in conjunction with an elected forum. Since then, uh, there have been other attempts to get um, participatory models in the school more formally structured. In the 90s, there was uh, something called the Alpha Group, elected with representatives from students and staff from every part of the school, with no powers as an advisory body whose aim was to improve the communication and debate between all the different parts of the school, which is something that I haven't touched on, but the school itself needs to think very hard about how it communicates inside itself, but also to communicate better between the school and the chair. And that existed for about three years at the end of Alan Balfour's time and just the first year of Moisten Mustafavi's <coughs> time, it died out a natural death from the fact that once things sort of settled down and the new chairman was in place, when uh, calling notices were put up for people to stand and be representatives, very few people wanted to stand. And in the end, it became uh, unviable to have that elected group because not enough people wished to stand to be representative. So it, it, it died its own death. The constitution of that organization is also on the website as an example of a different sort of model, uh, of a, a way of trying to promote debate and exchange within the school, but not having any powers. Forum had some powers, though not very many, and those powers were slowly taken away until it died as well. Sorry, Irene, and then here. I mean, to me it seems like a, a, a very curious um, example of balance of powers, that sometimes we give a lot of power to a single individual, the, the chair, as a chair we hope is going to act in a beneficial and enlightened way. 
we don't always know what's going to happen. See, uh, a lot of the work is being done in secrecy, inevitably perhaps, and sometimes with a lot of disgruntlement on the part of the school community. And at other time, where this disgruntlement disgr comes to the surface, and it seems that the power suddenly tip over <coughs> with the school community. And I am wondering whether this is something to do with the AA tradition, or whether it is something to do with its constitution with the system which we have and last perhaps I'm wondering whether this is actually a wise way of running the school whether there might be um, a more uh, uh, I mean a better and more continuous less crisis prone system of having the school function I mean could we kind of start thinking about that by in a way going back to Hugo's point that whatever constitutional reforms we make you know, they can't be expected, as it were, to cover every possible instance. And it would be quite unrealistic, and I think kind of self-destructive, if we thought that, as it were, the Constitution should become so elaborate that, as it were, it, it automatically forms the type of chair that we have. Um, you know, and so I think maybe we should start the other end and think, well, you know, chairs come in completely different kinds, Let's sort of run, you know, two opposite possibilities. Either you have a chair who is a, a sort of uh, kind of hyper-compromiser, someone who always kind of seeks uh, to manage a consensus uh, and is extremely attentive in one way or another to views expressed within the school. That would be kind of one model. The problem with such a person, in a sense, is precisely that that chair, him or herself, might start to generate, you know, rather too much kind of bureaucracy. Now let's think, on the other hand, of an absolutely kind of non-compromiser who has a kind of uh, vivid but rigid kind of vision uh, to bring to the school and who really, you know, is not likely to brook uh, a large number of compromises. That's also a kind of legitimate kind of possibility. But of course, what that chair risks, in a sense, they, they're upping the political stakes. They risk the possibility of, of finally losing uh, the confidence of the school. Now, it seems to me, you know, uh, we will continue, you know, we'll always be confronted uh, at the AA with a range of different types of chairs. Um, they both come with advantages and disadvantages. With the kind of non-compromiser, the situation in a way reverts to the fact, you know, as w we might describe um, the AA constitution, that from the point of view of the chair, is what you might call kind of uh, tyranny tempered by assassination. It's a little bit like the early Roman Empire. Um, you know, this person has very strong powers, but the more they use them, uh, in a non-consensual way, the more they run the risk of losing the school's kind of confidence. Now, I don't think the, the Constitution itself can be expected to prevent the dangers that either side have. What it has to be, in a way, is in the middle, is a kind of settled set of rules that everybody knows and which ultimately can be applied to if a situation breaks out that, you know, uh, the school becomes unhappy. It could just as well become unhappy with the over-compromiser, that we're not, we're not doing something novel, we're not doing something forceful. And that could be harder to remedy. Can I just sort of add something to that, which is that um, it seems to me that, that listening to this discussion, <coughs> one of the things that you might think about is how you institutionalise conflict. In other words, if one has the kind of ruler who rules through sheer kind of force of imagination, um, then that can work as, uh, so long as there isn't outright rebellion against him or, or her. But one way of, of, of producing a situation that might be more stable um, in terms of governance, and thus speaks the person who's read Machiavelli's discourses, not just the prince, um, is to go for a firming up of the rules by which um, decisions are made. In other words, this question about when 
a meeting is correct and when, when it's possible that a decision can be made. And the role of forum, it seems to me, are important areas where you might think about reviving um, various sort of strata in the governance of the AA that perhaps have been um, sort of neglected um, over recent years <coughs> in order to institutionalise mechanisms for um, having conflict and, and working through problems before you end up with a let's assassinate the um, guy who's boss. Can I... Uh, I I'm not sure if I'm completely in agreement with what Mark just said. I think if we just reflect on our last three decades and the three chairmen that we had, in Moison, Balfour, and Boyarsky, we couldn't have three more different type of people with very different styles of management. And yet, in the three cases, there was a nova centralization of power and a nova centralized manner of operating. And this was not a function of their personalities or styles. This was a, a reflection of the fact that in between our school community that often only gets mobilized in moments of crisis and the office of the chair, we don't have proper procedures, instances, and structures for this famous uh, no participatory model to actually operate. So it's all very good to talk about participatory democracy, but participatory democracy is not purely about spontaneity. It also needs its structures, and those structures are not in place. And the fact that the, the, the school community meets every now and then in moments of crisis and vote, that for me is not at all an indication of participatory democracy. So Boyansky uh, you know, is a good example. People often refer to Boyansky as very authoritarian. I don't <coughs> think there was nothing intrinsic or genetically you know, authoritarian in Boyansky. It's just that the whole situation, the moment when he was shown, led to that. And we didn't have uh, the powers. I don't know exactly the story of the four. But why is that that happened with Boyansky, but then happened with Balfour? No, it was not, was not called Forum. Then it was the Alpha Group, but then happened with Moisson. Why is that the school community does not have the power to establish those structures and keep them going and creating an ongoing process of participatory democracy? Can I just make it clear? I mean, I would completely accept and agree with that, with the qualification that I don't think the regulation of that should itself be in the Constitution. No. That's the point. Hi. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm a third year student. I was my first year at the AA. Um, I've been attending the lectures and the meetings, and one thing I'm, I'm wanting to know that I'm missing is what is the role or the purpose of the AA in relation to its responsibilities to the students, in relation to its responsibilities to the world, in relation to its responsibilities to the profession? And also, what is the role of the student what responsibilities does a student have to the AA, to the world, and to the profession? And I'm speaking, what is that role ideally? What is it that the AA wants to achieve? What does it want to be in the next 20 years? What does it want to be right now? A very simple, clear statement. We want to be the best school in the world. How do you measure that? I don't know, but it's got to be something that we can hold up and say, OK, is what we're doing in this instance helping us to achieve this? Is it, is it helping or hurting? Are we lacking in this area or are we succeeding in these areas? And uh, it's not said in all these specific problems that we're speaking about, I have nothing to reference it to. You know, I think it, it's a very hard definition to make, and, but it's still it needs to be ma made so that you can test it. You can test decisions against it. Um, and that, that's all. Well, it's a very big question, and it's the sort of question which can't be answered through any sort of constitutional structure. But, but I think, in a way, it's, it's what many organizations now give the dreadful uh, term sort of mission statement. Where how do we know what we're trying to do, and how do we know how we're going to try to achieve it? And I guess you find that in the AA, it comes through. Uh, in a multiple form. It comes through the actual work of all the different 
units in their statements. They are making very clear statements about what they intend to do and how they're going to test it and what the outcome should be and why they do that and what responsibility they see that that has to broader issues of the world and, and, and so on. And you can see it from time to time when the school has to sort of sum up its position. For example, the end of the year show and the publications that come out of that are a sort of manifesto of why we think what happens here has significance outside these walls. And that what we're doing here is not simply training some people <coughs> to go and be good technicians. We're actually trying to create a sort of culture of debate and argument and, and a whole bigger picture within which people form themselves to be very useful in the world and in the profession. Without saying, in order to do that, you must do A, B, and C in order to do it. So it's a bit difficult, I think, to try to write down what that should be. And the AA, in a way, can answer those questions by saying, well, look at the results. Now, who are the significant practitioners in the world? Who are, now, where are the interesting questions being asked in our world? Uh, are they coming from the AA? Yes, some of them still are. Now, can we get more of that energy and engagement coming from the AA? Yes, we could. Now, how do we do that? What, what would help that? And that gets down to issues that we will discuss, I'm sure, throughout the rest of the sort of debate about actually the educational model, whether there are other ways of empowering and improving that, getting teachers and students to, to interact in different ways, different, different crossovers, different forms of generating better debate, and so on. So that's all part of the, how the AA tries to continually refresh and review its way of working which is a slightly different problem from the one of governments. It's, it's an intellectual problem, the one of you know, what, what, is, what are we producing. The one of governance must be there underlined. If we don't get that right, we damage the possibility to create the conditions in which the intellectual world can thrive. Um, and that's, I think, the problem for the discussion today, is actually trying to, to look carefully at those bits of the governance and see if we can get that to work better. Not saying that if you do this, that will do that in terms of some intellectual advancement, but that if we don't get that more transparent, more clearly structured, more carefully thought through, it will damage and undermine the other part of what the AA does. So it's a bit of a non-answer to your mm -hmm. question, but it's trying to, in a way, distinguish between what we're trying to discuss today and what would be a different sort of discussion. I mean, if I could just add to that, I mean, I don't think that your question, in a sense, either could or indeed should kind of have uh, an unequivocal answer. Because, as it were, you know, perhaps one could put it the other way around and say, you know, the purpose of the school, the in, of the institution, is precisely to provide a plural framework in which many different answers to your question emerge and that each of those should show respect to others as part of that condition of questions and answers. So as it were, it's not just as a failure to answer you, it's that in some sense the failure to answer you is one of the principles of the school. I had a question for Sam in, the, in listening to all this. And, um, <clears throat> whether in, if we were to focus on um, strengthening, I think as you called it, uh, firm up the rules by which um, decisions can be made. Um, you've heard reference to one or two types of organization that the A has had at different times that have mm -hmm. failed, had periods of success or, and then faded away. Are there models that you could describe to us of different ways of of doing things from associate democracies? Um, well, I suppose, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the course, there is a course. Um, I suppose one, one way that I might reflect on, on some of this would be to say that, that one of the problems intrinsic to one individual holding all the power of decision is that no one individual can have all the intelligence and, I mean, we see this in the world at the moment, no one individual has, has all the intelligence at his or her 
fingertips and is um, able to think from as many perspectives as possible. In other words, <coughs> a certain number of, of people arguing and discussing with one another, I believe, it generally make better decisions than one individual left to the, themselves. However, you do then reach potentially the problem that, that Mark identifies, which is um, the need to, you need to have someone who, in the end, is in charge of the institution. And if all they do is listen to a body that's discussing um, and never actually stamp their own will on anything, for want of a better way of putting it, um, then you end up without leadership or potentially without effective leadership. So the question is how to produce a structure that has an effective leader who nonetheless listens to those who might be regarded as the wise fellows in his midst. Um, in other words, one, one could kind of summarise this as the contrast between an increasingly kind of presidential model of, of doing things where the president is kind of on a different planet from his or her kind of elected officials um, and a, a prime ministerial system where you've got a kind of collective responsibility but nonetheless you know, the head guy kind of has to um, have primary responsibility for decisions that are made. So there's a balance between having a system that, that fosters kind of dynamic leadership by giving the, the leader of the institution enough power to, with which to be dynamic and on the other hand not ending up in a situation where you end up um, with one individual apparently having all the power. Now it seems to me that there need to be some ways in which the collectivity can um, curtail the activity of that leader. Now whether it is, whether as the AA functions at the moment, it is simply that, that a vote of confidence is, is enough to do that, or whether there are some other measures short of a vote of confidence that one might want to build in. It seems to me that's the area where you need to think about the kind of Isn't that, that question. In, in a way, the vote of confidence is, is always a nuclear option. In yes, this, it is. Situation yeah. of mm. It might be the most appropriate one in the end, <coughs> but um, there are... <laughs> there might be other ways of kind of reining people in. I mean, it is true that the, the relation ultimately of the chair and the school, you know, is and does work very much like nuclear deterrence. I mean, you know, he can do pretty much whatever he wants, except he's got to keep the confidence of the school. And in the last resort, as it were, uh, it could lead to a vote of confidence. But uh, as people, I think, are kind of moving towards, the, the question is, you know, if that's the sort of what you might call the, the final deterrent, uh, you know, how does one think about conventional warfare at the AA? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. what, what are the modes of conflict and their, res, uh, you know, their resolution at a level below that of kind of crisis? Mm. Could I ask a question regarding the role of the council in all this? Because I think every time we mention the chairman as an all-powerful being, we neglect the powers that the council could have if they would take them. Um, after all, as I understand it, the chairman is accountable to the council in many matters, be it a financial or what course the school is taking as a whole. And I think in recent experience, we have found that the council has taken very much a back seat and not represented the, the larger wishes of the school community. And I think, in a way, the Alpha Group and maybe the forum were both made redundant because there was, was already an organ within the school that could take that role of either communicating with their electorate, which is the school community at large, or controlling the chairman, on the other hand. So, so I wonder if a constitution could encompass a kind of new definition of how the council would function within that system. Well, do you want to respond to that? I think if I was to make a very simplistic statement, I think you could see that the failure of both the forum and the failure of the alpha group was the failure of not having effective control. And the model that we have is that effective control only sits in council. But I think the failure of council to be able to deal with that control is their lack of connection with the activity of the school. And so I think that that's where we need to examine the model. And I think that in a sense, uh, my view, my personal view is, is um, 
and the position that I'm promoting to council at the moment is that school community needs to be part of council because that's the only mechanism that um, uh, it seems to me <coughs> that you, you can actually affect without um, damaging the flexibility. You can affect these checks and balances which actually could deal with a conflict resolution without resort to nuclear war. Uh, and it often you really don't need to resort to nuclear war, you just need to sort of move a few deck chairs around. And I think that any, <coughs> any uh, renewal of the Alpha Group or the Forum is going to fu fundamentally fail unless it has the authority and the powers that are vested in Council. There's, a, there's one thing that I find <coughs> or that I think is very valuable with giving the chairman a lot of freedom and a lot of power. And that is, he doesn't have <coughs> to think about in two weeks they're going to vote no against this decision. He has to make a series <coughs> of things that he progressively loses confidence. In other words, he has time to do some questionable things without having a, being slapped, having to go through certain barriers every time he does it. If over a matter of time, he hasn't instilled a certain amount of faith in the community, then it, it just becomes that, you know, then it's addressed. But if you, if you put the students and you put someone directly in front of him that he has to go to every time, it, it, a person will get tired of that, you know, which is, I think, what you described happened with it. Uh, Alvin. Um, I, I, at the moment, when you're elected to council, there's a, I mean, it, there's an expectation that it's a few meetings in an evening, every few months throughout the year. Which is, there's only so much workload that can really be, in a way, taken on in that time. And I'm, w I'm wondering if, in the examination of this new, of a new type of, of um, grouping, as it were, or, or representation, whether that would necessitate a change to that type of uh, model of meeting. Um, it just seems it has an enormous amount more to discuss and take on and, and think through as a result. Um, I, I think that we mustn't really delve into the level of detail because we're trying to actually deal at principle. Um, I think that c c you know there isn't um, there is no mechanism here, or the no wish, I think, to take the authority away from the role of the chairman. I think it all really I'm teasing out is that um, in reality, that if if the school community wants to have a more effective voice rather than a single point of uh, um, sort of the single point of, of censure, uh, then the logic, it seems to me, is to move up the chain. Um, but I kind of, the, you know, there's no, I don't think there's any wish on councils to have to expand the kind of function or the role. I think the reality of it is that council traditionally were based upon members that came forward from the association out of practice. And I think that the nature of the school over the last 30 years has changed in the sense that the alumni are no longer entirely based in London. And uh, much as I can, obviously, the people who are on council are friends of mine, and uh, I would admit that we all uh, rotate around this kind of uh, London architectural scene, it is true to say that we <laughs> didn't, don't in any way really represent the kind of past ambition or the reality of the of what the school is now providing. And so I think that that kind of old and rather sort of cozy uh, relationship is, is, is in a way needs um, fundamental review. Um, and I think that they're kind of the mechanism of that change needs to be quite kind of radical and at that kind of level. Yes, um, <coughs> it seems that the issue at hand uh, in this discussion is that there is you know, some measure of concern about uh, the all-powerful chairman 
Um, and I think, you know, what Roger said is very interesting, but it's not moving up the chain seems to me to be kind of antithetical to the AA's history and we really ought to be moving down the chain um, or at least to consider that as another mode of uh, operation. It seems what follows from that um, is the issue, going back to the issue of we do things by tradition, that there is a very long-standing tradition that the council don't have a hand in the academic processes of the school. But it seems there's potentially a kind of paradoxical position there that you know, it's legitimate and we, we are all concerned about possibly having checks on, on the amount of power. On the other hand, the council, if they follow up that uh, suggestion, would be acting against the tradition, I think a very long-standing one, that the council don't interfere with the academic process. I think you can also <coughs> reflect on whether there are uh, various points in the structure, whether or not council changes it well. There are other things that, that, that could be done. For example, there could be, we could devise uh, a clearer written structure of accountability of the chairman to the school community. It wouldn't be that difficult to do that. The current schedule of duties is pretty messy. Um, and that, without being prescriptive, could mean that anyone who was in that all-powerful role would know that from time to time, and we could su suggest what would be the appropriate frequency within which there needed to be a, a sort of an exposure of an agenda for debate. Not that what came out of the debate would then be binding upon what that person did, but that they couldn't, in a way, operate entirely under their own. They couldn't slowly, as chairmen tend to do, work themselves into a very closed box and report to council when they need to uh, and report to the school in a very fragmented or not at all. But that we could, at a different level in the system, write another sort of model. Uh, someone then looking at the post might say, well, in that case, I don't want to take the post on because the only reason I would want the post was because of this extraordinary tradition of having got it. I can do whatever I want and nobody uh, will interfere. But most people, I would have thought, would respond to a clarification of that relationship between the chair and the school community in a way if it was carefully and, and thoughtfully done. So that would seem to me to be an important area to work on. Whether there's also the question suggesting that we could also try and engage council more, I think it does raise this problem that most council members are incredibly busy and see their role as trustees and directors as being a very <coughs> light touch in terms of being legally responsible for the whole thing and only picking up really big crises. Very different from a management group or a management committee sort of model, which uh, would require a lot more time and input and probably a very different body of people. I think we're going to have to... I mean, we are quite late. I think th I'd just like to to make kind of one observation because I think it, it cuts across a number of issues that have been discussed and I think it's also an inevitable kind of anxiety in the mind of members of the school. And it's this, it really it concerns the question of the power uh, of the chairman. Now I think it's very important when people are kind of framing their <coughs> proposals or whatever that they make a very clear distinction when they're thinking about the power of the chairman that you don't automatically deal with the problem of the power of the chairman by reducing the power of the chairman, yeah. if you see what I mean. That there's a sort of almost like a reflex. You, you say, let's think about the power of the chairman, and the pro then the problem seems like the chair has too much power, and what would be the instruments of, in some sense, mitigating that or sharing it. Whereas it's perfectly logical also to think that that power actually does and, and can be used uh, to maintain the vivacity and the future of the school, in which case what you're concerned with is not so much cutting down the power as in some sense making very clear the conditions on which it's accountable. Mm. And, you know, I say this because simply, as it were, to, 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 to make a distinction where perhaps people tend not to make a distinction usually. 
Now, first of all, on your behalf, I'd like to thank Sam for coming over. Uh, and I hope she'll kind of watch the process emerge. Um, and thank you very much, Hugo. See you this evening.